people serve God. Uh, I do. I try not to take it too personal, but but uh, I'm sure, you know, God does because he's a jealous God. Uh, he'll have no other gods before him, he said. Some of the things that are being taught today just, I mean, it just takes away from God's word, period. If you'll turn to chapter 12 of Romans, I wonder, you know, how many people are really, really serving God? I, I question that so often. And uh, I mean, you know, it's, it's easy to be religious and, uh, and look, the, look like a, a Christian maybe, but in, I mean, in, in some of the ways you you talk or whatever, but to really be one is something else. God uh, had a plan for man. He never planned for man to, to walk in, in failure. He, uh, he put everything in place for us to succeed. And some of the things you hear taught today and, and said today out of the pulpits and from individuals is that you'd almost think that God's plan was for man to be a, a complete failure. And the reason I know God wanted man, man to succeed is because before the foundations of the world, he had plans for Jesus to go to the cross for us. And his plan was for us to be reconciled back to him so we could walk in success, so we could walk in fullness so we could walk in the blessings that he has already prepared for, for, the, for people. Anyway, in, in chapter 12, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, and only by the mercies of God can we, but by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, a living sacrifice. Everybody say living. 
Folks, don't you know there in life there there's life. I mean, there's vitality, there's strength, there's joy, there's peace. That's life. That's what real life is. Life is not on drugs. Life is not being drunk on wine. Life is, you know, not uh, uh, in in some of the things people think life is. But life is full of of life. <laughs> Life is full of joy and peace and so on. And, and having your desires, in the desires of your heart filled. He says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. We can't really say that we've gone beyond the call of duty. Not in any way can we say that. And be not conformed to this world. Now, there's a lot of different interpretations that could go along with that, I guess. But if you conform to this world, then you're not conformed to God's world. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind by the renewing of your mind. It takes a lot to renew our minds because there's been so much garbage taught out there. So much stuff said, even in churches, that has destroyed and taken away from God's plan for man. God has a plan for man. And his plan was that we be successful, that we walk in life. What did Jesus say? I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. But he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove something. We're going to renew our thinking that we might prove something. Hello out there. But God says, transform your thinking, renew your thinking so you may prove something. Think about that now just for a minute. We're going to, we're going to be transforming our, our, our renewing our minds. We're going to be transformed and renewing our minds from a different way of thinking than the world, that we may prove something. Hallelujah. That you may prove. What's, what do you, what's he mean? You may prove it. Well, if you prove something, that, then you, you've, made, you've shown evidence of something to be true. So he says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So if I can transform my thinking and be not conformed to the world and transform my thinking according to the word of God, then I can prove God's perfect will. Now, this is God's will. Not what somebody else might say, but this is God's will. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So this is where our faith is built so we can use that key, as I said last Wednesday, to, to access the power that's in here. There's power in this word. This word is alive. And the only way to access this word is by, by believing it. You, can't, you cannot get a hold of this and you cannot see it work in your life until you believe it. That's why Jesus said, if you doubt not in your heart, then you'll see it happen. So God has a plan for man and that plan was that they might live a life here under his will and in his will, that we might live it to the fullest. 
while we're here on earth. Now, here's what's happening. And I, I wanted to get this out of this, this book here because I thought he said it rather well. He said, but Christians have been mis misled into all kinds of fallacies by some false cults and religious leaders. They've been misled. It is almost a universal teaching in our modern time that it is God's will for man to be in poverty. That's right. There's a teaching out there. That it's God's will for men to be in poverty and in want so as to keep them saved. If I can, in other words, if God can keep you poor and wanting, then he can keep you saved. <clears throat> that man is a subject of defeat. Now, this is what's being taught today. That man is a subject of defeat and that he is powerless to avoid sin, sickness, and failure in life. That is some of the stuff that's being taught out there. Now, there's all kinds of stuff going on out there, and you know, all this stuff is against God. It's against God. And, there, and this type of stuff is being taught out there, and so we have all these, these thoughts and, and uh, teachings out there that's just got people all messed up. And they believe this stuff. They believe that God wants you to fail. He wants you to be in pain. He, he wants you to be sick. That man is subject of defeat and that he is powerless to avoid sin, sickness, and failure in, in life. That pain and physical suffering is the lot of everyone that they are blessings of God in disguise to believers. Now, I believe it comes on us because of other reasons. I believe it happens because of other reasons. But, and the, one of the big reasons is because we let the devil into our life. We allow him to, to do things. We don't, we don't stand on the word. We, in other words, we're conformed to the world. We don't fight for our rights in God our rights that God has given us, the blessings that God has given us. God has blessed us. God has given us so much. Let me, you know, think about this. If God, if God wants us to be so poor and sick, why does he turn around and bless the rebels instead of blessing his children? You see... The church has, for, for not everybody, but a big part of the church out there has given in to these types of thinking or these types of thoughts. And, uh, and so it, it, they think that it's a disguise to, to the believers that man must live in sin every day and, and either in thought, word, or deed and that no man can live a true and holy Christian life that we all must accept these and other conditions as the common lot in life for all. Now, that scripture I just read there to us tells me something different. It does. It says something different to me. It says that if I will not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of my mind, I can prove what is the good. Amen? Amen? I think that's what it said, good. Good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen. Now you stop and think about when God created the world and put Adam in the garden, that uh, he uh, gave him everything he needed. Amen? Amen. He was blessed. And God, the only reason death came upon man was because Adam and Eve disobeyed God. 
And he says here that in, in chapter 12, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the mercies of God and only by the mercies of God can we do this, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. So when I present myself to God and I, I say, God, I'm yours, you're my father, you are my God, I trust you with my life. I trust you with everything that I have. I present myself to you. I'm going to go over some things here. Uh, that talks, I mean, it's concerning prosperity. And prosperity covers a lot of territory. It says that I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So God wants that. In fact, he says, I take pleasure in the prosperity of my people. He takes pleasure in it. He takes pleasure in you doing well. Now, we have an enemy, and God's not our enemy. The enemy is the devil. And Jesus said he, he's the one that's come to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the one that's here to steal from you, to take from you, to make you sick, to make you feel bad. He's here to do that. And Jesus said, but I am come that you might have life. Well, life is more than breathing. I know we determine life by that, maybe, by the heartbeat and by breathing. But life is more than that. Life is spending time in a space somewhere. Even after we leave here, we're going to live somewhere else. And we know that God has made it to be such a wonderful place that that's, that's the way God wants us to have, or the way God wants us to live. He wants us to be in a place where it's beautiful, in a place where it's wonderful. Well, yeah, we're living in a mean, cruel world. I mean, evil people. They're just evil. They're just seeing how much pain they can inflict upon the person. How bad they can make somebody feel. That's the devil. That's what the devil does. He tries to make your day as miserable as he can. Not God. The devil. So think about this. God's plan for man had to be something great because he give us all of this. Everything he put here on earth, he put it here for us that we might be able to live. And it also says in one place that we might enjoy the things that he's given us. It says in another place that our joy might be full. God wants your joy full. God doesn't want you sick, beaten down, trodden down to keep you saved. That's not the way God is. God wants you to be a free will or willing to serve him with your own free will. That's why he gave Adam and Eve the choice there in the garden. They had to have a choice. He, he wanted them to walk according to their own free will you know, to choose. And God wants us to choose life, he said. Is that not what he said? I put before you life and death. Choose life. I think most of us in this room tonight would choose life. <laughs> now, 
one of the first laws of prosperity, before we can go anywhere else with it, we must believe that it is God's will. We must believe that it's God, God's will for us to prosper. Amen? Amen? That we might prove. Everybody say prove. prove. Well, in order to prove it, you've got to believe it. Amen. Amen. I've always preached it. If you can't believe it, then you're not going to see it. You know, if you don't believe in healing, then you're not going to see healing. If you don't believe in whatever God's spoken, then you're not going to, if you don't believe God can save you, you're not going to be saved. Amen? Amen. So you first must believe that it's God's will for us to prosper. And like I said, so many people have been taught that God doesn't want us that way. God wants us poor so we'll be obedient. Now let me tell you something. When you become disobedient, you become poor. But when you stay in the obedience, David said, I will not forget God in my prosperity. He said, I will not forget God in, the, in, the, in my prosperity. In other words, I will keep God in my, in my life and in my mind. I will keep him even when I'm prospering so I can continue to prosper. God wants you to prosper. And so if this is a fact, and it is, then God will see to it that you, pro, that you are prosperous if you will learn the laws of prosperity. That I may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I'm going to prove something. You see, Christians are afraid to prove God. Amen. That, 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 in other words, they, they lack in faith so much that they're afraid to prove God. Well, I don't want to prove God's word wrong. Excuse me, you're never going to prove this word wrong. The only way you prove this word, this word to be wrong is if you do it wrong. Amen, and that's what they're doing. This word here will do what it says it will do. And so if I can be transformed, and, it's, and it says I can, if I can renew my thinking, and it says I can, then I can prove God's will. Let me ask you this. Why would it be God's will for you to lack the things you need in life if you're really his child? Why would it be God's will for you to lack what you need in life if you belong to him? Why did he even waste time putting it here? To bless the rebels out there. <laughs> that's the way that, I mean, that's, that, you might as well say it because that's basically what they're saying. And so it's very important before you go any further with this, you must first believe that it's his will. So that means I've got to change my mind. I've got to rethink this thing and transform this thinking from what it used to think to another way of thinking. And I have. I said I have. Because, my friend, when you're raised up in certain things and taught certain things, you think that's the way it is. But, you know, I, I want to know the will of God. And I want to know what God wants in my life for me. And so that's why you have to present yourself a living sacrifice. That's why you have to present yourself to God, not to a church, not to a denomination, 
Hello? But to God. So, it's not God's will. It just doesn't make sense. But until Christians wake up and believe the whole Bible, then they're not going to have the things that the Bible says. People want to take away from God's Word. One of the, the second thing that we've got to do in order to prosper is make God a partner, make Him president. Amen? Not the co-pilot, as the stickers say. God is my co-pilot. No, no, no. No, you don't want to do that. He's the pilot. Amen? Amen. So, there again, that's some people's thinking. Say, well, God is my co-pilot. No, he's my pilot. I'm the co-pilot. And so, you have to make God your partner. No matter what you're doing, make God your partner. If you make God your partner, you then you, you work with him and you obey him and you obey his word and you line up according to his word. Amen? If I'm obeying God's word, then I'm going to prosper. If I'm obeying God's word, then this word is going to work in my life. Now, does that mean I'll never have a problem? <laughs> of course not. I think it was Jesus said, in this world you have tribulations. So that doesn't mean we live a problem-free life because, my friend, you still got an enemy. The devil's still trying to torment you. And we have to rise above that in our faith, with our faith, in our, in our belief in God. We rise above that so that we can be able to keep God's word in our life, in our business, or wherever. So we recognize him in all that we do. What did, what did Paul say? He said, do it as unto the Lord. Amen? You know, one of the, one of the biggies, I think, is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a good thing for us to practice no matter what we're doing. Treat somebody like you want to be treated. God blesses that.